Ironsworn as a game requires minimal setup, but before launching into a new campaign, there are a couple of things you are invited to do, namely to create a world and to create your character. The rules do not make a great distinction between which takes precedence. Either is fine to start with, depending on your preference in playstyle or your creative flow. But for me, I've always found putting some context to the character I'm about to create helps me a great deal envisioning a persona. So we're going to start by creating a world. Hey everyone, how are you? I'm Anderson, this is Kill 10 Rats, and today we are going to do our world building for the Iron Sworn campaign. This is part of the generic game setup that the rulebook recommends you do, and it provides a handy workbook to take you by the hand and guide you through the process. It's the World Truths workbook in the end, because the Iron Lands are somewhat predefined. The setting is sketched but not detailed and you're also free to just completely discard the generic setting that the game comes with but and substitute your own but we're gonna stick to the iron lands and we're gonna come up with our truths that will influence the context in which our character operates one of the things the setting assumes is that the iron landers that are currently inhabiting the iron lands are relatively new to the area and that there was an old world before that that befell some kind of cataclysm causing an uh, exodus of the first Ironlander generation about two or three generations back that made landfall and established the first settlements. The Ironlands are harsh and the Ironlanders are a hard people. They weren't always like that in the old world depending on what you decide to go with but circumstances make them into what they are today. We need to determine now what made our ancestors leave their ostensibly higher level civilization, more developed civilization. And there's a few suggestions and recommendations that we can go with. One is that a conglomerate of savage clans called the Skuld invaded and just tore through all the established kingdoms, a little bit like the Huns or the Mongols, and that the Ironlanders first generation are the SKPs that made for the ships and just, you know, rode off into the unknown, ending up on the Iron Lands by chance and finding refuge there. Or perhaps having heard of the existence of the Iron Lands and trying to find them. Another option is that a sickness was spreading and befell all the kingdoms of the known old world and that... Uh, after a harsh voyage, the survivors again made it to the Ironlands. Option three is that a resource shortage happened in the old world and through over farming, perhaps like a mismatch of population growth and the ability to sustainably feed them caused a outbreak of famine and overall resource shortage that eventually drove some of the old worlders to try and find refuge somewhere, try and find new resources somewhere. In terms of where we land on this for our settings, uh, I'm going to go with all three. And in, in to my mind, it makes sense that they're all kind of connected. So um, I think the combination of, let's say, weather phenomenon causing more like a global resource shortage uproots the Skuld, who then invade, who bring with them plague and disease, perhaps a little bit like the historical precedent of the Mongols uh, just firing the bodies of plague victims into a city or you know, being accompanied by rats or gerbils that carry fleas to spread the plague, something like that. So we have basically all factors that in a way also historically manifested where population growth and resource shortage come hand in hand to set up a plague and you have some invading force that doesn't make it a lot better. 
Now, as the name implies, Iron Sworn, the Iron Lands, iron is a factor in the setting. It can be a mythical factor. It can just be a happenstance that iron is a common resource to be found in these Iron Lands. Or it can just be an expression that iron is sort of like the character trait that runs through the Iron Landers, where the harshness of the land forges them into a hard people. I'm gonna go with more of a mythical approach here particularly because there is a, a setting element that immediately sort of caught my eye as a set piece, which is that inscrutable metal pillars are found throughout the land. They are iron gray and smooth as river stone. No one knows their purpose. Some say they are as old as the world. Some, such as the iron priests, worship them and swear vows upon them. Most make the warding sign and hurry along their way when they happen across one. The pillars do not tarnish and even the sharpest blade cannot mark them. Now in, in the setting that I'm envisioning, I think the iron pillars are what saves the first settlers from being wiped out upon making landfall. I feel like the events that unfolded were that the continent wasn't completely empty. There is later on a section dealing with the so-called firstborn, which is your elves, your giants, your um, wolf people. Particularly was the resistance of the firstborn that initially pushed back any initiatives for the Ironlander ancestors to make inroads further inland. But that they found eventually that these pillars that were strewn throughout the landscape in seemingly random places kept the firstborn away and that the settlements that are the oldest are all surrounding one of these pillars. One thing I do think happened is that while regular weapon cannot harm the pillars, the Ironlanders eventually found implements also forged from that kind of iron, which in my head also has a little bit of an engraved quality to it. So there's always a, like some kind of unknown runic script embedded in the iron pillars and in these iron weapons, and that they found that they could for lack of a better word, mine or, or dismantle parts of these pillars to in turn create new weapons from them, which then allowed them to push back the firstborn even more to the point where now they are driven back fairly far into what is called the deep wilds and the far north of the Ironlands, or they've learned to coexist with the Ironlanders because they are now sort of in control of most of the country. It also creates a bit of an interesting conundrum and resource shortage there where you have to kind of balance keeping the pillars intact with creating enough weapons for you to be outfitted and it also makes these iron weapons a bit special. So that's what we're going to go with. The next uh, question we're being asked to confront and to establish our own truth about is legacies of are we the first humans to come here or was there some ones that came before? The options are that either we are the first or that there were humans before us and that uh, all of that is left of them now are a savage feral people that the Ironlanders call the broken. A third option is that there was a sort of a mythical ancestor race that lived on this continent even before the firstborn were brought into the world and that we can find these ancient ruins of that people in the Ironlands. I like both of the latter, so I think there are broken tribes about, mostly also more in the northern regions of the Ironlands, closer to the Shattered Wastes, which is like the farthest northern region of the known Ironlands, but that there are also these ruins that are strewn throughout the continent, and that this is perhaps also where caches of iron can still be found and discovered and that these ruins are perhaps also where more adventurous settlements are being established to have a base camp to explore these ruins find the iron trade in it etc etc so uh, ruins abound but usually in less hospitable places and the ironlanders that inhabit the encampments around these ruins are perhaps the most um, hardened of the lot. Taking a little bit of a cue from Simba Room behind me, in case you're familiar. The next question deals with what kind of communities can be found in the Ironlands. Options are that it's just 
assemblies of isolated homesteads uh, that do not have much contact with each other. The system also introduces the concept of circles, which is a sort of a civilization organization concept here that uh, humanity has settled here in circles and some of them encompass multiple settlements and each of them is governed by an overseer. Sounds a bit fallouty. And the third option is that the Ironlanders have sort of succeeded into forging the Ironlands into a home and that there are some roads and trade caravans between settlements mostly centered around the southeastern part of the Ironlands called the Havens and then some outlying settlements radiating out from there. I like that most mainly because it gives the option also to lean a little bit towards having infrastructure that supports a bit of a more dark fantasy element of having some petty kings emerge that operate through war bands and there's a bit of warfare going on which is an option that we're presented with a little bit later that I would like to go with so we're gonna have some iron lands that are maybe not really developed but there are some roads there are some trades there are some settlement clusters governed by something that perhaps in the old world would be a baron and now calls himself the king of what's not so let's go with that that kind of brings us to the next point which questions on how leadership looks in our version of the Ironlands and there the third option is that numerous clan chiefs rule over petty domains most are intent on becoming the one true king their squabbles will be our undoing so that's what we're gonna go with that uh, we did bring some old world greed with us even though the melting pot of the Ironlands perhaps forged the Ironlanders into its own distinct culture that is no longer too far influenced by the battle lines of the old world but that's still the new communities and the new um, civilization here kind of goes and makes the same mistakes that brought the old world to the brink. Such is human nature, I guess. And again, ties neatly into the next point, defense, where it touches upon the point of war bands. So the bigger settlements, in my mind, operate and maintain war bands of their own, also as a part of like aggressive expansion. Perhaps not constant warfare, but definitely conflict. And the smaller settlements will maintain some kind of double function, militia, rangery types that protect the outskirts and will eventually raise more of the citizens under arms if need be. The next question is about magic and mysticism. Uh, does magic work? Is magic real? Is magic powerful? And uh, in, in my mind, in the Ironlands that I want to play in, magic is very indirect and that perhaps also came as a surprise to the first settlers. So there is an option here, magic is rare and dangerous, but those few who wield the power are truly gifted. That is part of it. And that for most folk, magic is a thing of the past and perhaps something they might not even believe in uh, ever being real of some wizard throwing a fireball openly in a ostentatious display of magical power because that stuff just doesn't work in the Ironlands. Perhaps something to do with those pillars some kind of magic lightning rod or absorbent feature in there that makes magic work differently in the Iron Lands, perhaps something to do with the ley lines cursing through the land, perhaps with the iron itself, we may find out. But the fact of the matter is I envision the old world as being a bit more high fantasy with actual magic users who then when they made it to the Iron Lands, the few survivors uh, quickly found out that their powers backfired immensely and that a more indirect ritualistic approach to magic is the only thing that really works. So establishing kind of a new school of magic or being humbled by the fact that the folksy, old, superstitious ritual users of the old world all of a sudden were the ones that came to the Iron Lands and were successful in their dealings. Which of course makes you wonder where the old rituals came from. Perhaps they're so old that they tie into the Iron Lands again to that first civilization. Well, maybe we'll find out. In terms of religion, which is the next point we're touching upon, religion I feel like is fairly indirect with a little bit of a twist on it. So one option here says a few Ironlanders still make signs of mumble prayers out of habit or tradition, but most believe the gods long ago abandoned us. 
this I feel like is the most likely scenario. The Ironlanders are more governed by their belief in forging their own destiny and fate than any kind of god that as indicated by the old world clearly doesn't really care too much about them. But I have one twist to put on it, a little spin that popped into my head that there's like a quasi savior or religious figure that the various groups of Ironlanders all had in common. And that's a figure I would like to call the Pathfinder. Now the way I picture this figure operating is that perhaps several generations before everything really went badly in the old world the pathfinder appeared in pretty much every kingdom and civilization that made it to the ironlands so a very diverse group of people that all have this figure in common that provided them with the ways to find the ironlands if ever they needed to and that the people that bought into his prophecies that this will eventually be necessary are the ones that became the ancestors of the Ironlanders and that they hold the Pathfinder in some kind of savior quasi-religious esteem and attribute a lot of qualities to their own way of going through life to how would the Pathfinder do things so what would Jesus do essentially and that comes with themes of, you know, I find my own way, I forge my own destiny, but I, there is a predetermined destination for me. Sort of a metaphysical application of the path through life. And this also eventually models into these iron pillars who perhaps some people perceive as gifts from the Pathfinder and that some priesthood now emerges that is claiming to speak on the Pathfinder's behalf and that is where these notions of the Iron Priests come from that rally around these Iron Pillars and, and turn this into some religious affair. Perhaps not in every settlement but some expressions of this flaring up here and there now and perhaps giving us another one of these dark fantasy opportunities of fanaticism and eventually having this boil over and becoming a thing that gets out of hand a little bit. Next question deals with the Firstborn. We've already touched upon it previously, so the Firstborn do not like us very much. They let that be known pretty much when the first Ironlanders made landfall and found themselves uh, battled at every corner until they eventually figured out the correlation between the Firstborn not going near the Iron Pillars and their own salvation. So right now we're leaning towards the option that the Firstborn live in isolation and are fiercely protective of their own lands. They've been pushed back into regions that the Ironlanders haven't made the effort or perhaps haven't been able to conquer or conquer yet. And that they are keeping to themselves but are fiercely isolationists and that it wouldn't be a good idea for humans to go near. And that this also is again perhaps a, a friction point where the firstborn are in areas that also these ancient ruins can be found and that the expedition forces of the Ironlanders going for these ruins and trying to find their caches of hidden secrets and treasures and iron routinely come into conflict with the firstborn then. Next question deals with the topic of beasts, um, monstrous creatures like um, just forces of nature that will eat your face. And I, I like that threat of them popping up every now and again. So I would like to go with the option that beasts of all sorts roam the Ironlands and that they dwell primarily sort of remotely, but that they venture into the Ironlander regions that settle regions to hunt and occasionally just make off with some Ironlanders for a midnight snack. And lastly, the question of horrors, which is like the Lovecraftian cosmic horror element to the story. Are there such things as horrors? Um, what are they? How do they express themselves in the setting? I don't think it's like a full-on zombie apocalypse out there, so it's not like constantly the dead rise and the horrors emerge from every corner, but they are there, and if you venture too far from the beaten path, you're liable to encounter one of them, and probably one of them is already enough to really put a crimp in your day. And that overall is the setting that uh, the campaign will be set in. So here we have it. Let's make a character next.